Hey, Jay. How are you, Patrick? Good. How are you doing? Good. Nice to meet you. Meet you as well. Um, should I have headphones on or how's our audio and stuff? It sounds pretty clear to me right now. How about myself? Yeah, very clear. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I hear you well. Okay, cool. So before we start, just uh, give me the proper pronunciation of your last name. I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> it's Solari. Okay, I was pretty sure, but I wanted to be, be positive. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, let's get into it, man. Um, before we get into the hot toddies band, jazz band, I wanted to ask you just a little, it seems like you have a very interesting upbringing. I wanted to ask you sort of about your upbringing and uh, musical path, if you would. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I grew up taking music lessons starting around five um, and was taking a percussion using the ORF method when we were, uh, I have an identical twin brother. So we were taking lessons as kids. And then I moved into drum sets shortly thereafter. I think I started playing drums around seven. And that kind of played throughout high school, was in, you know, indie rock bands and that kind of thing. And then um, when I got to college, I went more liberal arts and I went up to Bennington. So I studied uh, uh, drumming with Milford Graves and they had a jazz program up there. It was a little more free jazz, but I just ended up discovering uh, classical composing, which was mm -hmm. sort of a surprise. I, I got really interested in like Stravinsky and the early ballets and stuff like that. And then kind of really dove into that. Um, Tobias Picker was up there. I started studying with him. And then I realized I wanted to kind of get a little more serious about it. And then I transferred to Manhattan School of Music as a composing major, classical composing major. So I kind of went down that path. And then when I started that, I just dropped playing drums and then, you know, got my undergrad uh, in composing, minor in piano, and then did graduate school, had a fellowship for opera composing. Mm -hmm. down Louisville and then right before I went there is when I discovered swing dancing through my twin brother and okay. uh and then you know I was doing a lot of composing but then I kind of started getting back into into the jazz world and kind of started putting on these events and um you know and, and then kind of fast forwarding I just uh you know I've always composed and done projects but then I realized I was missing the spontaneity of of jazz and drumming and, and kind of the in the moment uh playing and then kind of uh right before the pandemic started um got into this uh got into playing drums again through the new york hot jazz camp which is okay. where i met gabe who i started the band with <laughs> okay so you and gabe were the were the primary sort of central figures for starting the group yes okay cool yeah so I mean, uh, yeah, it's quite a path. I mean, the, the classical composition, operas, and and then back to to drumming, and then and then swing music. So uh, when it comes to jazz drumming, I guess are there any major influences that that you have that you could share? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it's kind of eclectic. Like, you know, I, I grew up listening to to jazz. Both my parents were very much into jazz, so I kind of grew up listening to to big band and stuff like that. Um, you know, so there was always, you know, I remember, I remember as a kid watching, you know, the Buddy Rich drum battle with uh, uh, Animal and uh, yeah. <laughs> loved that. <laughs> um, you know, and then, and then, you know, in high school, I was, I was very into, you know, classic rock. So, you know, there's obviously Bonham and, and that whole thing. And I, I got a kick out of the fact that my 1920s bass drum is the same size as Bonham's bass drum. It just weighs like 20 pounds less. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, there's there's a lot of a lot of different different things. So you know, uh, when I was studying with Milford Graves, we did a lot of African percussion yeah. and kind of interesting you know rhythms and and things like that. So it, it kind of comes a little bit um, from all over. Great, cool. Um, and then so in terms of swing music, swing bands. I mean, you said you grew up listening to to some of it. Um, what when how did you put the, what was the concept when you put the band together? How did it come up? How did it come about, really? Um, well, as I'd mentioned, we I met Gabe at the New York Jazz Camp, and um, my friends Bria Scomberg and Molly Ryan were running that, and you know they had asked me to help promote it. Okay. And instead of paying me, I was like, "Hey, can I just like take the camp?" 
uh, you know, because I missed playing drums and I'd kind of been thinking about it for a while because I'd, I'd been producing a, um, a ton of events through Prohibition Productions, which is my production company. Mm-hmm. You know, at the time we were doing about a hundred events a year and a lot of them are geared towards swing dancers with live music. Sort of right. like trad jazz, hot jazz, um, but but a good chunk of those events are for swing dancers. And I, you know, started swing dancing in grad school and and, and that would, had become part of my social life. Right. So I took the jazz camp, um, you know, it was, a, it was a trad jazz camp, so a little bit more hot jazz oriented, but when Gabe and I met, we kind of connected <clears throat> and, um, you know, afterwards we got together to play a little bit and we realized, you know, we were having fun and and I was telling him about the swing dance world and we sort of did a couple of small gigs here and there mm-hmm. and uh, kind of pushed that in the direction um, because there's, you know, the reality is there's not really a ton of bands that really play for dancers. Sure. There's a lot of people that, a lot of bands will say, oh, sure, you yeah, know, we can, we can play for dancers. But in terms of like, you know, can you go to a, you know, a, a swing dance, you know, with, a couple hundred swing dancers and keep them dancing all night is very, very different than having a few people dancing. So, um, you know, because of my work producing all these dances, I was around some of the best swing bands in the city and even in the country. Um, and that very much informed what I wanted to play, how I wanted to play. And Gabe and I really kind of dug into that. And we, um, you know, kind of spent uh, the first I guess it would be about a year and a half exploring all that and kind of, you know, getting our craft together. Um, and then of course the pandemic hit. So. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And it seems like you got, so you, it seems like you started the band just kind of right, right before the pandemic. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, the, I guess we really were starting to play our first few gigs, I think were in like 2018 ish. Okay. Um, the camp was in 2017 um, and so, the, you know, by 1819, we were starting to play. We actually started recording the album that we were releasing in 2019. So it was just a little over a year after we kind of started putting things together. Um, so it, it's been it's been an interesting journey, you know, considering like that album really charts a lot of uh, kind of where we started and kind of where we're going. Right. Yeah, but it seems like um, even during you, we were pretty creative during the the pandemic. It seems with the videos that you guys put out and stuff. Um, what was the one with the puppets? Is that five o'clock coffee? Yeah, that's actually an original that Gabe wrote. And um, yeah, so so during pandemic, uh, we were. I mean, obviously, all musicians, you know, especially in New York City, it was was really tough because you know we were stuck here. No one had cars. Uh, no one had gigs. It, you know, it was really it was really difficult. But one of the things that I started doing is um, through Provision Productions, I started doing this live stream where I'd bring bands in, you know, from the swing world and we'd kind of do things. And, you know, everyone was, a lot of musicians were experimenting with this whole, how do you do virtual music, you know, with Zoom and things like that. And um, we ended up doing, uh, we realized the Zoom thing didn't really work. There was too much delay for live performances, but, we did um, start recording remotely. So all of us would lay down a track or one person would lay down a track and then we'd kind of add to it. And we put together uh, what we called our quarantine EP. So that was our first recordings that we released. Um, We kind of them as singles at first and then then eventually uh, put them all together as an EP. And, And then two of those we made videos with. So you know, I'm more of an audio guy recording, uh, didn't really know much about video. Um, but because of pandemic, you know, dug into that, like we did. (laughs) And then, uh, you know, uh, you know, played with, uh, uh, iMovie and then eventually Final Cut Pro. And then we did these two videos. So we took, the first one was Duncan Bagel, which was the Slim and Slam song from the thirties. And, um, you know, we had, we did the recordings, I'd asked everyone to shoot a video of themselves. So then I had these videos, you know, cut them out and then put them in, everyone was like in bagels and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And then realized, wow, that was really hard because there was like no green screen, you know, the backdrops were crazy. And then the second video, which is one of the puppets, um, five o'clock coffee, uh, 
we had a lot more experience with. So I was able to get everyone to shoot mostly in green screens and kind of came up with this crazy concept of the swing dancing puppets and, um, uh, and had a lot of fun with that, you know? Yeah. They're both very clever. I mean, <laughs> I, they were fun to watch for sure. And then it seems like, uh, you know, especially with those two songs, you know, there's a, there's an entertainment factor. Um, and it reminds me a little bit of like a little bit of maybe like what Jimmy Lunsford used to do back in the day, or even Nat King Cole, Cab Cow. Uh, it's music for entertainment. And I think uh, there was the, and it was something that maybe even during that time, it was a little bit light, lighter hearted songs. I think it probably yeah. served the purpose, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, I think one of the things that, that sort of inadvertently happened is that we were, um, wanting to have a band that would be fun to play and and fun to listen to. Um, you know, there's so much serious music. And I think also because we all work in other areas of music as well that that are, you know, it, it can be a little bit heavy handed. So it's nice to have something a little bit more fun. Play. Plus, we're playing for dancers. So, you know, you want to have a fun environment. But then some of the song choices, too. I mean, like, you know, Dunkin' Bagel is probably one of the only songs actually about food instead of you yeah. know use them for something else um and you know when you see the the there's like one scratchy you know film of them playing at some jazz club in in uh, LA and clearly they were just having fun on stage with it so you know we kind of wanted to do something with that um and and also you know i think cuz we are playing for dancers and and in a kind of a party environment it mm. sort of affects how we play you know Right. Um, um, of course, a lot of, of of your material comes from the Great American Songbook, jazz jazz standards and such. Um, so how much of your material would you say is original material as opposed to standards? Um, we have two original songs. OK, that's it. And the rest are all standards. So we um, so Gabe writes our original material. Right. And um, and so five o'clock coffee was one of them. And um, and then the other one was Kilowatt Stomp, okay. which was commissioned by the um, Hell's Kitchen Kilowatts, which is like a dance troupe um, read, uh, led by Jamie Shannon and Tony Frazier. And they're sort of like a aerials, high flying swing group. And, and and Tony really wanted something very specific, which was really interesting. Like he he wanted a kind of a fairly complex piece of music that was short and very fast that would allow different kinds of of uh of dance moves and and aerials and and things like that and so he and Gabe talked a lot about that and then we recorded that uh in February of last year okay. and then um we uh we've performed it a couple of times actually just at Lincoln Center um you know a week and a half ago mm -hmm. uh, as well so it's it's a it's, it's quite a cool number but those are two originals and then we just do the standards um kind of in our own way right so who handles like the uh, the arrangements and the orchestration? Um, I mean, so Gabe, Gabe and I co-lead the band. He's really our music director in a lot of ways. Um, and he, um, you know, what's interesting is that he does a lot of the arranging on the fly. So right. one of the things that I, I feel, I believe kind of strongly in is that we're not, we don't have our noses buried into sheet music. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having worked with a ton of bands, I mean, um, and, and obviously no judgment, but I, I love it when a band is aware of who they're playing for and they're connecting with the audience and they're not just like staring at a piece of paper. Right. And, um, you know, I mean, it makes things sometimes a little messier, <laughs> but when it it also can make things really exciting. And so Gabe, I think without realizing it is just incredibly good at arranging things on the fly. And uh, I mean, like when we played the Lincoln Center um, a week and a half ago for, for Summer in the City, and we probably had the largest number of musicians we've ever had on stage. We had a lot of special guests okay. from Swing World and Hot Jazz World and stuff like that. And what was interesting is that, you know, we hadn't really, we didn't have anything necessarily written down, but Gabe was able to very, I mean, it looks effortless, but he's also incredibly talented, but he was able to kind of really arranged in his head on the fly in the moment and then going back and listening to some of the videos and watching them i mean it, it sounds like we're playing charts yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, I guess probably just from playing so frequently and it seems to me i, I play in a, a band that's 
we do swing type material and and uh sometimes the things that happen organically and if you're able to shift for example if people aren't responding to the song and they're not really dancing you know you're going to cut a solo here or shorten the arrangement i'm sure it's not an issue <laughs> with you guys but um you know it, it's that you sometimes you come to those great moments because you're not so buried into a chart would, would you agree with that yeah i mean you know i i also think that different things work for different musicians so you know um like uh, myself and a, and, a, and a bunch of other musicians have played a lot with gordon webster who is people don't really know outside of the swing world but in the swing world he's like a rock star like probably one of the most famous swing musicians like playing around right now and he has this crazy energy but there's no charts and um a lot of the the top swing musicians have played with his group at some point and you know, it was interesting for me kind of coming at this a little bit later than everyone else is realizing that there's this energy that comes from that you know it's a little bit chaotic but there's an amazing energy that happens when you're really in the moment and you're really listening mm -hmm. and um you know, I think because we, because the Toddies have a, we play every Wednesday at Summer Nowhere. It's kind of been our weekly gig for the last year. We just had our one year anniversary. And one of the things I've noticed, I mean, because I'm sort of still like the the newest of of all the musicians, you know, that, that, that we work with, but I just realizing it's kind of like, you know, cooking or something like that. You just like the choice of which musicians you bring in is so important because it, you know, certain, the way that people listen, the way they listen together, the way they interact. And, um, you know, I've been kind of experimenting with that, especially over the last six months um, and, and, and figuring out kind of like where we have great blends of people working together and that communication happens because some people it, it, it's just natural and some mm -hmm. people sure. it's not. And it's, I think for what we're doing, it's really, really important. Yeah. So do you have, you have a, a different, sort of lineup uh i mean is is the band pretty set with the, with who you have or is some people moving in and out depending on their uh there's a lot of a lot of movement um yeah. i mean one of the interesting like when we played lincoln center mm -hmm. i realized like wow i gotta hire a photographer to take a band portrait because the first time we have all the musicians in one place right, and, right. you know because even even the album cover we have was from two years ago and it doesn't have everyone on it that we're that we're playing. We just didn't have any other band portraits. And I think the way that also, especially in New York City, uh, in kind of like the the trad jazz world, you know, people are always shifting in and out. So, um, you know, the the main kind of, I mean, Gabe and I started the group, but you know, Gabe, Gabe has blown up, and he's, you know playing with he's the first violinist in turtle island string quartet so he, you know they played on terence blanchard's last album that got the group so he has a grammy nomination he's on yeah. the road all the time so he's playing you know a fraction of our normal gigs so it but it's interesting that it also helps force me and the band to figure itself out a little bit more carefully like how do we still sound like the same group when not when the when the rotation hat when we have constantly rotating musicians so yeah. like Poindexter guitar players become really key you know there's there's certain people where I'm like okay if I can have three people of the core group or the first call group and mm -hmm. then you know that kind of can make it work so you know we have our two singers Hannah Gill and right. Queen Esther and yes. um you know so it's like as long as we have one of them and mm -hmm. you know we have Justin uh or Gabe um you know, and uh, either Ian or Brandy on bass or Wallace, like we're fine, right? You know, but it, it's interesting because it's definitely not what I think how most bands, you know, you just have your set, yeah, group of people, but we we're constantly fluctuating, and it's exciting and nerve wracking and <laughs> frustrating. Yeah, it's funny how people. So you know, coming from the jazz world, uh, when you try to explain it to people who are more rock oriented, they just <laughs> they're like, "What do you mean you got?" Different, three out of your five guys are different tonight i'm like well yeah i mean if we know the we know the language you know and you just sometimes you just hope for hope for the best but it is uh it is a comfort when you do have at least two-thirds of musicians uh that you're that you've played with for a while that's, and that's what we're like the big thing with our lincoln center um performance was trying to get the that core group there and, and thankfully it's a big enough gig right. and it it, it paid well so we're able to really get everybody I mean but even still like you know we've been working with the trumpeter Alfonso Horn 
mm -hmm. who's amazing. And then he like fell and hurt himself like uh, about a month before and wasn't able to play it. So we ended up having to call in uh, uh, subs. <laughs> Yeah. that i mean you know danny john Acucci, who's played with us a bunch and is also very big in the swing world he stepped in for one of the sets and then bria skomberg who's you know a phenomenal trumpet player and ironically the person that organized the new york hot jazz camp where gabe and i met so it was kind of a wonderful full circle yeah. situation and when she was playing with us at lincoln center was the first time we'd ever played together okay you know? and it's still but you know because of all the other things it just f was effortless you know everyone kind of fit in they brought their a game and it's it's uh it's really amazing to see that and hear yeah. that and i would imagine when you're playing a place like lincoln center there's a there's a certain uh commitment or you know it's not like your average gig per se uh yeah. people are going to put a little bit more effort and uh you know that's that's awesome was that the first time you've been you've played there for me, yes. So mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, what's interesting is that uh, a lot of the musicians that we work with, you know, they've been playing for years and they play all over the world. I mean, you know, um, like I said, you know, Gabe has his thing with Terrence Blanchard and and um, the Turtle Island, Justin Poindexter guitar players at Jazz Lincoln Center, you know, Hannah Gills performed all over with Postmodern Jukebox. Uh, you know, all these people just are are incredible and i'm the new one you know like I, I i find that a little ironic and it's a little intimidating because i only really started playing drums again right before the pandemic and so for me it's it's always a huge huge learning curve and if lincoln the lincoln center for me was the largest stage i'd ever played on right and everyone else had done it before yeah so I was like all nervous and everyone else was like, oh, it'll be fine. It'll be great. You know? And, uh, and but it, I mean, but it was great though, because then it made me, as we actually got there, sound checked and started playing, I was like, oh, this is very comfortable. These are all the people we play with. You know, the, the stage was larger and that's a very different environment when you're, when you're playing in something that big, but, but it felt very familiar and that was very comforting and great right. music. Out. Yeah. Were people dancing? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, it, apparently um what i heard it was it was the largest turnout for a swing event this year it was over two thousand people um and and i think one of the larger turnouts they've had uh for a swing awesome. in a while so it was it was great and we also you know played as many tunes as we could cram into the the allotted time so right sure yeah. so like in terms of swing music i mean obviously it's endured decades now uh what do you think of, of why do you think that is? Why do you think swing is still kind of accessible uh, in certain circles? Um, so what's interesting is if, okay, so let's say you are wanting to have a night on the town, you want to go out and socialize, right? Sure. Like you go out to a bar or you go out to a restaurant or whatever, but you want to go dancing, generally it's a club, mm -hmm. right? So the thing is that you know club dancing you know it's super loud it's always that kind of uncha, uncha, uncha kind of thing and you know i personally never really got into that i never really knew what to do with that yeah and i think what what for a lot of people um you know what do you do if you're not into that and i think a lot of people discover swing dancing inadvertently and you know i discovered it through my twin brother who he was doing it and eventually i went and saw him you know dance and i was like oh my god this is crazy like, room yeah. full of you know 100 people dancing and what, what what's interesting is that it's a very very social kind of dancing right it's club dancing you're kind of by yourself doing your thing but right. with social dancing you have a partner so you're always connecting with somebody and you know it's really intimidating at the beginning but it it becomes you know it's amazing when you start to do it because you know, you're, you're, you're having a conversation with your partner, you know, it's a, it's a dance conversation. So, but even if you're a beginner and you know, three steps, you know, you can kind of do it and you can talk to your person, meet somebody new. And, you know, one of the things I think is wonderful is that it's a fairly open, non-judgmental place. Like, you know, if you come to, to one of these dances or one of the events I put on, you know, you'll see all ages, all demographics, sure. people from all over. And, and that's wonderful. You know, I mean, you have 20 somethings to 80 somethings 
you know, and it's, it's, everyone's kind of just hanging out and listening and dancing. And, and it's, um, it's a, it's a very wonderful community. So I think once people discover that they get hooked, you know, and even our Wednesday event, actually, what's interesting is at Summer Nowhere, we have, you know, like, you know, swing dance community comes out. Sure. But after New Year's in particular, we started getting a ton of just like, 20 30 something showing up that clearly didn't know how to dance but they clearly were there because they knew it was a jazz night right and they're just kind of hanging out you know i call them the jazz curious you yeah. know and and they um i think it's it's probably a lot through social media there's a lot of like there's a lot of stuff about um you know like the piano bars in new york city became really trendy like in the last couple of years and um and this whole kind of like pro like 100 years of after, you know prohibition kind of right. the 1920s again and and i think those are just people wanted to go out and socialize so i think it's uh you know it's a very different environment that i think what most people are used to so it's not for everybody but like it it's pretty compelling i think especially people that go to it for the first time they think it's like one thing and then it becomes something else you know people think of jazz in, in a particular way yes and this is like you know party music <laughs> right right you know, yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously very accessible. And um, it's interesting you me mentioned, like, p some people just coming to listen as well, which was, you know, it's always been kind of the the swing tradition, especially when it got towards the 40s, where, you know, um, you know, with, with Duke Ellington's bands and some of those bands where the music became almost a little bit more, not always just geared for dancing and, and a little bit more orchestrated, or maybe that's not the proper word, but you know, there was an audience for just the listening. So the music is so fun and it's so freeing that it allows you to to have that to move and and it could almost be a backdrop to your experience dancing. But as a musical form in itself, it's pretty compelling. Yeah. I mean, you know, also coming from the classical world, it's there's sort of a similar thing of like, you know, what's serious music and what's, you know, more cerebral music and things like that. And I and I always felt that was a little bit elitist. Like, like you can, you can have both, you know, yeah. just, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think with, and it was always weird for me when I was in conservatory, you know, in the classical side that like the jazz musicians called us legit, you know, right. which I always felt was just like, just totally unnecessary. Like it's not any more or less legit. Like you can't take, most classical musicians can't sit down and improvise. Right in the same way that a jazz, most jazz, you know, it's like they, everyone has their own talents that they're trained for. Mm. And so like, I think even though, like the way, the way that I like to approach things is yes, we're playing for dancers and it's meant to be danceable, but it's also meant to be listened to. Right. So like what was interesting for me is the first time we did really a formal concert last year, we did a little mini tour like to to DC and Maryland and and stuff like that, and we went to this beautiful theater um, in Maryland where Hannah Gill's from, the the singer at the Avalon Theater, and it was my first time playing a concert. Right, you do the other way around. People do concerts and then dances. Yeah, yeah. But it was interesting playing how we play, which is dance oriented, but then in a room where people are really listening, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh wow, we can all hear each other, and you know, yeah. The, the stage mix is really clean and people are clapping. But what was interesting is that it allowed us to do what we do, but kind of stretch out a little bit more. And then, and then there, you know, there's lots of interactions that happen because we have such talented musicians. And so that's always there. Mm -hmm. and I think like, even if you come to one of our big dances, it's there. You just can, you know, people listen for different things. So I think part of the reason it works is that we, we can um, entertain both dancers and non-dancers people who like jazz and people who don't really know about jazz. And I think that's actually really important. Yeah, I agree. I mean, um, it's funny because I, you know, I teach jazz history courses and, uh, you know, introducing non or jazz curious, as you say, I like that term, people to uh, to jazz for the first time. You know, it's just that they've a lot of times they're just not exposed to it. Um, and then, of course, uh, a lot of the gigs that I do now are sometimes restaurants or small clubs or some theaters and things, but there, people inevitably always seem to come up and go, you know, I didn't really know much about jazz or I didn't think I liked jazz, but like hearing it live gives a different experience, you know? 
Yeah. And uh, I think that's sort of to your point, right? I mean, just that exposure to it really kind of washes over the audience, you know? Well, even what you're saying, I mean, I think, I think coming out of the pandemic, everyone realized how much we took for granted right. live music and the difference between a recording and hearing something live. I mean, it's, it's a massive difference. And, and I, I feel, I mean, I don't know how long it's going to last, but I definitely feel that we're still in this kind of um, uh, honeymoon phase where everyone's like, oh, live music, yay. <laughs> Especially in New York, you know, and uh, it's, it is this small sort of renaissance period. And I think swing music and swing dancing in particular is a, is a perfect example of just that need for social interaction, especially after months and years of of not. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is that like one of the things that that's happened, you know, and of course, New York City is very different, but, you know, a lot of there were a lot of like feeders for people to learn how to dance, like a feeder kind of system in a way. It was very loosely, but like, you know, college kids would have a swing program at the university and then they would like go out to a DJ swing dance and then they would go out to like a bigger dance. as They got more comfortable and all they got messed up during the pandemic. So, you know things have been still evolving slowly. Like I, I'm hoping this fall, for example, will kind of start to get back to more of that idea where, where you know, the university swing programs didn't really happen until I think part of last year. Mm. You know, so, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's still kind of, we're still kind of coming back from that and there's still a discovery process happening. You know, a lot of things that really, like a lot of venues have closed, uh, mm. you know, swing the swing dance world is, you know, it's not like there's like specific places people can go for swing dancing. It ends up being more like independent producers like myself or dance studios, things like that. Um, you know, and and like, you know, we were in touch with people all over the, the country and the world in swing dance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like not every place has live music, you know, like, um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of times we'll be traveling to different cities, you know, because they, you know, they don't have the live music like like that we have you know yeah. like gordon webster is in korea right now with a bunch of musicians we play with playing a swing dance because you know they don't have it there yeah like, like i'm going to rochester next week with gordon to play the opening of a of a, of a new swing club you know so it's yeah. it's interesting kind of how interconnected everything is um yeah. and still yeah. growing back after pandemic right right and you know and doing swing you know having a place that would provide because for, obviously for swing dancing you need room you know you need a a space that's got an open floor right um that's really hard to find and that's hard to find yeah uh that that's cool and then um so let me shift gears a little bit and let's let's talk about let's talk about the album that seems like it's been in the works for quite some time sure so tell me about tell me about uh what we're going to hear on the on the new record yeah so um we started recording in early 2019 so the band had only been playing a little over a year at that point mm -hmm. um and i think our we did about four sessions in total so we had two sessions in 2019 and then um the pandemic happened and then we ended up having uh two sessions last year and um and so it was kind of challenging because you know we had uh, to figure out how to make this all kind of work together. And so there might've been 25, 20, 25 tracks that we had recorded all in okay. and then um, kind of narrowing it down earlier this year to, to realize, well, how are we going to make an album out of this? How do we make this cohesive, not sound like it's, you know, spread out over four years. And interesting enough, what we kind of discovered is that the, the, the album's kind of broken down into sort of like the two featured singers that we work with. Right. You know, so so the Queen Esther and then Hannah Gill. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the Queen Esther material, we had these amazing sessions with her in 2019. So those tracks tend to be from 2019 with Esther as our featured vocalist. Okay. And then, and interestingly enough, we also had Gordon Webster was sitting in on piano at that point. Um, and then last year's sessions seem to be more of the Hannah Gill sessions. So, you know, they, 
in, because they have different styles, like the Esther tunes tend to be a little bit bluesier, a little bit more Billie Holiday sounding. Mm -hmm. They kind of had a particular vibe about them. Yeah. Uh, and and then the Hannah Gill stuff, you know, so it's, and it's also because the recording technique, like they, we all recorded this in at my place. So okay. I have a pretty, uh, you know, good home recording situation. Um, okay. During pandemic, I built a drum room in, in, a, in a bedroom um, mm -hmm. that has, you know, kind of soundproofing so I can practice every day, not drive my neighbors crazy, but it also has built-in recording, like a snake, eight track snake into it. Okay. So you know, we can have a fair amount of isolation. And so the recording techniques changed a lot between 2019 and uh, last year, but it still was able, I think, to be fairly cohesive. Um, you know, we we had a you know the, a lot of the same musicians, um, you know, and I think it helped bring it together. And then I mixed everything, and so it, you know it was a process. It took a lot of time to kind of try and get everything to sound as close as we can. And then the final step with mastering with Andreas Meyer, he really helped kind of pull the final thing together. Nice. So when is it scheduled to uh, to drop? So the the digital release is July 28th, Friday, July 28th. Okay, great. It'll be on all platforms. Um, we have, uh, I do have uh, CDs, which we actually were able to kind of sell at Lincoln Center as kind of our pre-release. Mm -hmm. So I have CDs and cassettes. Cassettes. Yeah, that's a new, that's, <laughs> I shouldn't say a new thing. It's a, yeah, people are into it again. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of CDs. We only have a few cassettes. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> That's cool. So um, every Wednesday night, uh, somewhere, nowhere, that's Gotham Jazz. Correct. Could, get, the band can be seen there, uh, 112th West, 25th Street. Yep. Um, and you guys start 7 o'clock? Uh, 7 is our DJ, and then 7.30 the band hits. We play till about 11.15. So we do three sets. Um, you know, it's a beautiful club. It's on the 38th floor. It's incredible views of the city. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and they have, uh, I mean, it's a big club for Manhattan, but it's probably not a very big club for the rest of the country, but it's, it's a gorgeous, it's one of the most popular nightclubs in the city and it's, it's amazing. Okay. So it's a great spot. I mean, they custom built the stage for us because they're usually have DJs, you know, it pulls out and everything and it's a small stage, but right. you know, it's, it's become home for us and it's a really great spot. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And it kind of harkens back to the old old days too, where bands did have a they had a home, you know, they had a yeah a Sequoia theater or you know, yeah. the Queen club or what have you, you know. That's and that's different. been huge for us to to kind of get ready, uh, especially you know, getting ready for something like Lincoln Center and the albums, but you know, it's been amazing. So great. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, anything I missed? Do you want to tell the listeners or viewers uh anything that that we didn't cover today? Hmm. I mean, I would just say check out the album when it drops. Um, we've got some great music in there. It, it really spans kind of a, a range mm -hmm. uh, from kind of straight up swing to a little bit bluesier, slower, uh, soulful um, music um, to really kind of fast, almost hot jazz. Uh, so, you know, whether you're a dancer or a listener, I think there's something there for you. Um, you know, we try and, and have fun. And, and, you know, hopefully they will too. And, and you know, we're gonna be uh, putting together some videos uh, in the near future and trying to put together a, uh, a release tour and try and get out there a little bit more. And, um, you know, just check us out online and uh, we'll hope to, to see everyone out there. Awesome, and what's the website? Um, so it's hot toddies, uh, jazz dot band. Wait, let me just double check that got so many websites i know right <laughs> so there's prohibition productions which has um all the events <clears throat> that we do and then it's hot toddies dot band is the website okay and then Great. hot toddies jams band on social media all right cool and as far as uh yourself any uh any plans for anything more in the opera ballet classical world anytime soon yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, things got a little messed up with pandemic, but um, there's a choreographer I work with a lot in the ballet world uh, in Germany, and I was there in February, we had, um, they had two productions of mine performing up, up north. Um, so we're hoping 
to have some new projects coming out in the next couple of years. I mean, it's a much slower timeline in, in the classical world. And then there's this like circus opera project, which I think is going to be happening um, probably in the next year or so. So things feel like they're just starting to kind of uh, uh, come back in, in that world as well. But yeah, and that's just, you know, my, my home site is uh, solori.com. So, um, you know, that's where I keep all my composing projects. So Excellent. Great. Well, it was a pleasure talking to you. Likewise. And I uh, wish you luck with the group and the album. And we'll try to get some people out for you. Yeah, well, thank you for taking the time here. And, and please come out on a Wednesday and check us out sometime. All right. Sounds great. Thanks. All right. Take care.